Brian Hosmer. I'm the head of the Department of History and a professor of history at Oklahoma State University. Uh, my area of specialty is American Indian history, but more particularly, I'm interested in intersections between tribal nationhood and economic change largely in the 20th century. I've written a series of books on this topic and spoken on related issues for quite some time. McGirt versus Oklahoma is a 2020 decision by the United States Supreme Court that was in many ways earth shattering, but also um, really fairly mundane. And what McGirt basically said was that the tribal existence, the boundaries and the sovereignty of nations in Indian nations in Oklahoma were unextinguished or had never been disestablished, as the word goes, regardless of decades of uh, economic and political subjugation, that the nations still existed. This is enormous for Oklahoma because the tribes then have and retain jurisdiction, particularly over criminal matters, in a way that um, is sometimes viewed uh, hostily by the state government, which sees sovereignty as a, um, a zero-sum game. The more, the larger tribal sovereignty is, the more the state sovereignty is reduced, and it is part of a long-standing, centuries-old uh, dispute between the individual states in the United States and tribal nations about whether sovereignty continues through the ages. So it is an enormous decision, and it places tribes in a somewhat equal footing with the state government. So the question has to do with how scholars and journalists understand economic activity in Indian nations and Indian communities today and in the past. And indeed, this has been an area of great contention and confusion uh, among scholars. And I guess you could boil it down by asking whether ind indigenous peoples are full participants in the economic life around them or in the global economic life, or whether their lives are conditioned by cultural issues that place them outside what we might regard as marketplaces, capitalism, supply and demand, and the various things. And this may seem like a fairly obvious conversation, but it's enormous because the, uh, the way that we think about indigenous economic activities implicates and, and affects the way we understand what they do today. So if in indigenous nations today, as is the case in Oklahoma and other areas in the United States, are economically vibrant, have businesses that generate enormous amounts of revenue, particularly gaming, but not entirely gaming, the question then arises, does economic success make these people less authentically indigenous? And this seems like, right, an old conversation about essentialism, and, and, but it, it remains a really important conversation. It speaks to the way scholars have understood economic activity. Is there one capitalism or are there other ways of looking at things? And it speaks to the way that Indian nation's economic success is received today uh, by the general public and by political actors. And it has implications. So if tribes are successful and generate millions of dollars, and that is understood to be somehow less authentic. What are these tribal entities today? Are they counterfeit? Are they people who are just using tribal uh, you know, uh, designation to generate profit? Or can the answer be more sophisticated and complex that indigenous peoples, like peoples all over the world, are capable of adaptation and adjustment and thinking broadly about economic success in relation to their own identities? So this is an ongoing conversation. In fact, it's a conversation or a dispute that has shaped virtually my entire academic career. When I started working in this area back in the 1980s, there were very few scholars of indigenous America who ever even thought about economics, didn't think about it at all. And the assumption was that economics, the way we think about economy, was the province, was the, part, was the property of the colonial powers and that these kinds of activities were imposed upon indigenous people and also had everything to do with their disappearance. So it's a really important issue. How we think about economics and indigeneity has all kinds of implications. So right now I am working on a project and this is the subject of the presentation here. I'm really interested in the relationship between this McGirt decision, which demonstrates the ongoing sovereignty of indigenous nations, their own economic power, and how that shapes relationships between the tribal nations and Oklahoma state officials and the federal government even more broadly. And really my argument is 
that gaming success, this seemingly non-Indian excursion into capitalist marketplaces and profit making, has had the effect of positioning tribal nations in such a way that they are able to protect their sovereignty against incursions on the part of the state. So perhaps ironically, uh, economic success can be the instrument that tribes use to protect themselves in the here and now. But let's be clear that that is not all one way and there's a lot of dispute inside Indian country and outside Indian country about the effects of this kind of profit-seeking behavior. And so there are questions of what does this mean for us as Cherokees or Creeks that when we're engaged in these large multi-million dollar business enterprises and we're buying and selling property and participating in the stock market, does that make us less indigenous? So what really is interesting to me is the way that this moment in Oklahoma comes to encapsulate you might say decades of conversations and behaviors inside Indian country that seek to essentially find this balance between indigenous values in themselves and participation in the current world, right, modernity. And it is a deeply uh, conflicted and interesting conversation. So that's really what is taking a, a lot of my time these days, a lot of my thought these days. So for the last 10 or 12 years, I've co-edited a book series called uh, Tribal Worlds. And it uh, goes through um, the State University of New York Press, and I have a co-editor, a colleague of mine by the name of Larry Nesper, who's an anthropologist, working primarily in Wisconsin among fishing, with fishing rights issues and things like that. And we've now published about 15 books, and what Tribal Worlds really seeks to do is find a place where contemporary issues are examined in a kind of theoretically sophisticated context, but also have roots in history. So Larry is an anthropologist, I'm an historian, and Tribal Worlds really focuses sort of on where he and I meet. And we're really deliberate in the way that we use both tribal and worlds in the plural. And tribal is a complicated and contested question these days, or term these days. Uh, we want to embrace it. Uh, because it does speak to the nature, in many cases, of these Indian nations, right? That they are tribal nations in a very specific context. Worlds is plural because we aren't presuming one trajectory or one outcome, right? That these are multiple ways, and in some ways it reflects um, an earlier book of mine that was entitled Native Pathways, and it was about capitalism and Indian country or responses to capitalism in Indian country and in that case pathways in the plural was really the point right and that the idea behind those both of those projects is for scholars to pay more attention to what indigenous people are actually doing in their lives in their governments rather than presuming that that scholars know the trajectory right and that Indian people are creators and agents in their lives and the pathways and the worlds that they create are a consequence of Indian agency.